Well, you've had different sessions today on Marxism, on Marx. The question is, was Marx just a philosopher or was he just an economist? The fact is he's neither one nor the other. He's a combination uh, of, the, of the two. But was he just somebody who sat in a library reading books and writing books? Because that's one of the myths which are spread around uh, by the bourgeois, that all Marx did was write stuff. Um, if you look at the, uh, what he actually did, you realize this is a myth because he was a revolutionary and he was actively involved in revolutionary politics, not just in word, but in deed. He, he, um, he intervened in the movement um, and he intervened in uh, revolutions. Now, the Germany that Marx was born into was not like Britain, uh, which had quite a, a highly developed industry. It was still a relatively backward uh, country, fundamentally agricultural and peasant, and feudalism still existed um, in many of the states that, may, uh, uh, that were to become Germany. Um, so Britain and France had had their bourgeois revolutions. Um, Germany had not had its bourgeois revolution when Marx was born and as he was um, um, growing up. In the 1830s, you had the beginnings of a development of industry. And within a few decades, of course, by the end of that century, Germany appears as a major industrial power um, on the continent. And of course, then comes into contradiction with, um, with Britain. But very early on, in 1842, when he was uh, 24 years old, he was editing the Rheinische Zeitung in Cologne, um, which um, was a radical journal that, that he produced. And because of that, um, uh, he suffered uh, uh, expulsion, the paper was suppressed, and he was forced to move to Paris. Um, he uh, was in the process of becoming a Marxist. Marx wasn't yet a Marxist. Um, at this stage. You could say he was always a Marxist in the sense that he supported the ideas of Karl Marx. Um, <laughs> but those ideas changed and evolved on the basis of experience. He became a supporter of Feuerbach, his anti-religious stance um, towards Hegel, uh, turning against the idealism of Hegel and turning in, in a materialist direction. Um, and through Feuerbach, Marx was on a road towards uh, becoming a communist. When he was in Paris, after he, was, he had to leave Germany, um, he, he had encounters with French socialists, um, discussions with class-conscious workers, and he began to see society in class terms. He began to understand why those workers had those ideas. In that sense, Marx didn't invent socialism. Socialism is something that existed already as an idea. It wasn't a clearly worked out idea. There was a lot of utopianism in it. Marx obviously was to give it a scientific basis. But he started to see society in class terms. Um, he also began to read the English economists. You can see the different sources of Marx's ideas. The Hegelian philosophy, which he uh, stood on its head, as he said, or put it back on its feet, sorry. Um, the... Um, English economists, which were trying to understand how capitalism works, worked, and of course the socialism, which existed already in France as an idea. In 1844, um, he wrote the Economic and Phil Philosophical Manuscripts, which are still within the limits of, of Feuerbach's um, ideas. It wasn't fully worked out scientific socialism. There's Engels, who also comes from the same milieu, the young Hegelians, and he went to Manchester in 1842, saw the conditions of the working class and wrote a book about it, in which he also started drawing very similar conclusions to Karl Marx and published the book in 1844. And he drew the conclusion that the answer was a communist revolution. In September 1844, the two met in Paris, had weeks of discussions and came to the conclusions they had the same ideas and same understanding. In 1844, they wrote The Holy Family, uh, which is a critique of the ideas of the young Hegelians. But in 1845, um, they produced the German ideology, which is a book which I would recommend you read if you haven't read it, 
particularly the first part. It's, an, it's, it's a marvelous exposition of the basic ideas of, um, uh, of Marxist understanding of history, of society, etc. The funny thing is, they, pu they wrote it, they never published it. It wasn't published until 1932. Um, the reason is, Marx actually says it at one point, the purpose of writing it was actually to clarify their own ideas, which is what they did. They had their ideas clear, and then they proceeded to intervene in the movement with those ideas um, to build an organisation to, to change society. That book is really the first clear exposition of historical materialism which you've discussed in other sessions. And in their critique of the idealism that existed at the time, they referred to going from earth to heaven and not the other way round, i.e. basing yourself on concrete material world and not an abstract um, uh, fantasy world in the minds of, uh, of people. And they drew the conclusions that the way human beings, the way men produce their means of subsistence determines their ideas and their consciousness. This is a key idea of understanding how Marxists look at society. Either the development of the productive forces and how changes in the relations of, of property determines also how people think. And you see that, how people, people's ideas change from feudalism to capitalism. And it's based on the changing um, economic relations. Um, he gives an, an outline of the development of, of society through the changes in the productive forces. He then breaks with Feuerbach as well, because uh, whereas he moved in a, uh, the, the, uh, Marx's thinking uh, was clearly materialist, um, it wasn't enough to be a materialist. He also took the dialectics of, uh, of Hegelian thought and brought them together and explained how actually the material world moves in a dialectical way. The laws of dialectics apply to the real material world. Hegel thought that they were the laws of thought. Whereas Marx explained thinking is a product of the material world and therefore the dialectical thinking is a result of the way the actual real world moves, how matter moves itself. Um, they began to intervene in the movement. They turned to a German workers' organisation called the League of the Just, which was the, um, um, an organisation of German workers which had a public front which was called the German Workers' Educational Association. Um, which was learning from the Chartist movement, the experience of the English workers and how this could be used in Germany. Um, but they worked to convince the League of the Just of the scientific communism that Marx and Engels had begun to develop, as opposed to the utopianism which dominated that organisation. And they successfully won over the League of the Just, which then changed its name to the Communist League um, at the Congress in 1847, and then the aims of that organization became, quote, the overthrow of the bourgeoisie, the rule of the proletariat, and a society without classes and without private property. That remains our program, by the way. They established the program then and has remained ever since. At the second Congress they had in that year, uh, in November, that's where the Communist League asked Marx and Engels to write the basic principles of the Communist League, which was to become the Communist Manifesto, which was produced by the end of January 1848, and was sent to be printed just before the outbreak of revolution across the whole of the European continent. There was a, a revolt in um, an outbreak of revolution in Paris in February 1848 to overthrow the constitutional monarchy of Louis Philippe. But the movement in Paris sparked off a movement across a large part of Europe. In February, you had the revolution in Paris. In March, you had popular uprising in, uh, in Vienna against the Habsburg monarchy. And in the same month in Berlin, you had the movement against the Prussian Frederick William IV, um, who was forced under pressure of the mass movement to grant political freedoms. What did Marx do? Immediately moved, uh, uh, moved to Paris, where he had been expelled previously. He formed a new central committee under the authority of the Communist League, uh, had given him that uh, authority to do that. And from Paris, he started to send hundreds of Communist League members into Germany to intervene in the revolution. Initially, 
clandestinely because of the conditions, but once the revolution had broken out and political freedoms were established, more and more openly. And, and, and he drafted the demands of the Communist Party of Germany, uh, which I haven't got time to read here, but it's a program that he developed to intervene in, in, in that revolution. Marx and Engels then th themselves returned to Germany, to Cologne. Um, here we see Marx, the revolutionary militant, not the guy in a library uh, writing books, but um, he publishes the Neue, Neue Rheinische Zeitung, um, calling for the unification of Germany and, and other demands, and supporting the most advanced uh, wing of the, of the revolution of 1848. Um, the, what, what, what became uh, uh, clear in 1848, however, for Marx, was that in the process of the revolution unfolding, the contradictions became apparent between the workers and the bourgeois. The classic position would have been, well, the bourgeois are the class which will lead the, the revolution of 1848 in carrying out the bourgeois revolution in Germany and establishing the basis for a modern development of Germany, and the position that he had was that the communists would support that um, as, a, as a movement forward in history in Germany. Um, but it became clear, also in France, it became clear there was a contradiction already between the working class and the bourgeoisie. And this actually pushed the German bourgeois into a reactionary position. Instead of standing at the head of the revolution, because they feared the consequences of the movement of the working class, they retreated and compromised. From the pages of the Neue Rheinische Zeitung, uh, Marx lambasted the German bourgeois and he supported the French insurgents. He was accused under press laws, uh, he, he was arguing for a revolutionary government through popular insurrection, um, and he, he defended himself uh, brilliantly in the trial. Again, Marx was put on trial, uh, wasn't just sitting in, in, in a library writing a book. Um, the jury uh, declared them um, innocent, of course, because he, he brilliantly denounced the use of laws which had been surpassed by the revolution itself. That revolution, uh, of course, uh, failed uh, to achieve its ends. And uh, later in the year, you have martial law. Marx's paper is banned. Engels was participating in the Committee of Public Safety, actually took part in the fighting. <clears throat> he was actively involved. He was, a, he was part of the Baden army, um, took part in attacking Prussian troops, but faced with the overwhelming strength of the state, um, had to flee, uh, in this case, across the Black Forest and off to Switzerland. Um, martial law was imposed in Berlin by the end of the year. The German bourgeois was not prepared to lead the revolution and go all the way in overthrowing the feudal aristocracy, uh, only for offered passive resistance, and Marx... Um, there, he said, we need a people's militia, we need the workers to have control of the, of, of the arms in order to avoid this betrayal by the bourgeois. And you see how Marx, also they say, oh, Marx was rigid. Marx changed his position on the basis of events. His analysis flowed from events. If you read the Communist Manifesto, he says at one point, when he's referring to Germany, him and, and, and Engels, that in Germany, the communists fight with the bourgeoisie whenever it acts in a revolutionary way against the absolute monarchy, the feudal squirearchy, and the petty bourgeoisie. That's when you support the bourgeois. Engels, in the Principles of Communism, which he drafted as a preparatory text for the Communist Manifesto, he says, since the communists cannot enter upon the decisive struggle between themselves and the bourgeoisie until the bourgeoisie is in power, it follows that it is in the interests of the communists to help the bourgeoisie to power as soon as possible in order to sooner to be able to overthrow it, um, i.e. critical support. This is, what it, this is what it means for the bourgeois in, in overthrowing feudalism and establishing the conditions of capitalist development within which the working class then begins the struggle to overthrow the bourgeoisie. Now, 1848-49 was, was an international revolution. You had movements in some countries, insurrections, in others, uh, protests, deep street protests, to one degree or another, you had movements in Denmark, in Sicily, Sardinia, Piedmont, in France, in Prussia, Saxony, in Hungary, and Austria. There were also movements in Ukraine and Poland, in Ireland. Um, even Sweden and Switzerland saw some, uh, some, uh, some conflicts. Um, but in reality, they were an anticipation of future events. 
Um, later on, you would have the big movement that led to the unification of Italy in 1860 with Garibaldi and, and his, uh, his, his, um, uh, ad his revolutionary approach, let's say, to the unification of Italy. That's a, a separate subject. And eventually, of course, it was to lead to the Paris Commune in France. Now, what happened in 1848, as I said, impacted on Marx's view of the German bourgeoisie itself. He changed it. Um, he changed his position, um, in, in, in essence, anticipating Trotsky's theory of the permanent revolution. Because Trotsky, again, when they say, oh, he invented, he didn't really invent from anew, but he based himself on Marx, i.e. there are situations where a national bourgeoisie has become reactionary even before capitalism has been established, even before, let's say, um, its own revolution um, is being called uh, by history and they refuse to carry it out. And he wrote in 1848, he, he talks about the German bourgeoisie developed so sluggishly, timidly and slowly at that moment when it menacingly confronted feudalism and absolutism, it saw menacingly pitted against itself the proletariat and all sections of the middle class whose interests and ideas are related to those of the proletariat. I, can't, I haven't got time to quote the whole thing. It's called The Bourgeoisie and the Counter-Revolution, uh, published in the Neue Rheinische Zeitung, December 1848. Um, here, Marx is drawing conclusions about the nature of the bourgeois from that uh, it concrete experience. As of 1849, therefore, Marx begins to distance himself from the bourgeois democrats and move towards the building of an independent workers' organisation. He emphasises that need. Um, back in London, in exile, uh, after being expelled from France again, where he had fled to from uh, Germany, and Engels arrived in London via Switzerland, um, back to the clandestine, semi-clandestine work of rebuilding the Communist League. This was now a period of re-evaluation. Marx and Engels were elected to the Central Committee of the Communist League in, Ro in, in, in London, and they uh, wrote, um, for instance, in 1850, an address of the Central Committee to the Communist League. Um, and he analyzes what happened in that uh, revolution. What he emphasizes is that the communists of the Communist League, when they went back to Germany, because of the, of the, of, of, of the, of the move around the Democratic Party of the bourgeois, the communists tended to be absorbed into that and dissolved, in, in effect, themselves as, as, as a group. And Marx stressed the need that we cannot, uh, th this situation cannot be allowed to continue. The independence of the workers must be restored. And that they actually sent an emissary of the Central Committee to try and re-establish the Communist League. And again, to say that these people were just bookworms. Uh, one guy uh, called uh, Joseph Moll, he went back, he was involved in the fighting, and he was killed in the fighting in the Battle of, 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 River, of the River Murg. Um, he, he stresses, um, it's written by Marx and Engels, the, the address of the Central Committee, the treacherous role of the German liberal bourgeoisie. And, interestingly, this is where, uh, in 1850, he, he said, I'll read the last paragraph of, of the conclusions of this. Although the German workers cannot come to power and achieve the realization of their class interests without passing through a protracted revolutionary development, this time they can at least be certain, he's talking about perspectives, that the first act of the approaching revolutionary drama will coincide with the direct victory of their own class in France and will thereby be accelerated. His perspective was in France, where the, the bourgeoisie is in power and the working class is more advanced and more developed, the workers can come to power. Then he's talking about the German workers, but they themselves must contribute most to their final victory by informing themselves of their own class interests, by taking up their independent political position as soon as possible, by not allowing themselves to be misled by the hypocritical phrases of the democratic petty bourgeoisie into doubting for one minute the necessity of an independently organized party of the proletariat. This is in 1850 already in Germany. Their battle cry must be... And this is, this is for our Stalinist friends. <laughs> the permanent revolution. Marx invented the term. And then Trotsky took it up as, as, as a, and, and a developed theory. Um, you see, Marx and Engels had entered 1848 seeing it as the beginning of the end of bourgeois society. 
They then had to draw conclusions about the experience they'd been through. Engels, many years later, said this about that period. History has proved us, and all who thought like us, wrong. There's a Marxist who can actually analyse his own past and actually admit they were wrong. There are some people around who can never do that. It has made it clear that the state of economic development on the continent at that time was not, by a long way, ripe for the removal of capitalist production. It has proved this by the economic revolution which, since 1848, has seized the whole of the continent. I.e., instead of having imminent collapse of capitalism, you had a renewed period of massive development of the productive forces. And this comes back to the idea of Marx that um, no system can be removed so long as it's developing the productive forces. And they, and, they, and they drew conclusions on that. I'll have to skip. But the 1850s was a period of isolation from Germany, material poverty for Marx, often having to go to the pawn shop to, um, to uh, get money just to survive, to feed the family. Marx suffered liver disease. He lost several children in that uh, decade. He was helped by Engels, who was now in Manchester working in the family cotton business, and they were in regular correspondence in this period. But it was a period of general reaction, combined with a rapid development of the economy. With that came a strengthening of the working class, of course. The strengthening of the working class was to lead to a revival of the labour movement and the working class movement in the 1860s and 70s. As I said, you had the unification of Italy in 1860, you had the Polish insurrection of 1863 against um, uh, Russian rule, and it's in the context of this revived movement of the working class that you have the next big uh, uh, concrete work of Marx, which is uh, the working towards the foundation of an international organization of the working class. Marx understood uh, you needed an independent workers' organization, but you also needed an international workers' organization. And they prose proceeded, as I said, to build the, um, the, the first um, international. Um, the, the, it, it was a period of, of different developments, such as the economic boom also led to the development of reformist ideas, of opportunist ideas, a tendency of the British trade unions to see politics only in terms of the Liberal Party. Many British trade union leaders would go on to become Labour MPs. Um, th these were the conditions in which they were working. Um, but at the same time, you had in Britain, for instance, the rise of the trades councils, workers' organisations at, at local level. Um, strikes were taking place, and often the bosses in one country would bring in blacklegs from another country to replace the striking workers. And one of the um, uh, aspects of the first international was to organise to stop that, um, the in intervening in solidarity with workers of other countries, blocking the blacklegs from being sent, etc. Um, in France, there was a temporary weakening of the French working class after the defeat of the revolution. Um, in these conditions, you had uh, the idea that it wasn't socialism, it wasn't class struggle, it wasn't the overthrow of capitalism, but we could do have mutual aid, cooperatives, i.e. there was a move away from the idea of revolution. And in these conditions, you had the ideas of Proudhonism, which are basically a form of reformism. And you had all kinds of alien ideas within the movement, which is a classic. When there's a, when there's a defeat of the working class, a development of capitalism for a period, um, there's a moving away in the consciousness from revolution to the idea of reformism until, of course, the system goes into crisis again, as Rob explained in the, in the talk on, on economics. Um, but in France, although you had that political setup, you had the development of the economy and a strengthening of the working class. Um, the same in Germany. Um, the, the German working class was beginning to develop, and by 1853 you had the foundation of the General Union of German Workers under La Salle, and also the League of German Workers' Unions led by Babel and Liebknecht, who were uh, supporters of Marx. These were later to go on to form the Social Democratic Party, which was the real first genuine uh, mass independent working class organization um, in Germany. Similar developments we had in Belgium, in Austria, in Italy, in Spain, in Switzerland. There was an international revival of the working class that was the basis for the formation 
of this new international organization uh, which became known as the First International. In 1864, September, there was a meeting in London. Marx was present. Um, a resolution was voted by that uh, conference to work towards the building of an international organization of the working class with its center in London and with a committee of 21 members. And the last one on the list is a certain Dr. Marx who signed that, um, that um, uh, resolution. Um, Marx convinced that gathering uh, to adopt his rules for the organization. Um, but we have to understand not all those who were members of the First International were communists. This was the early days. There were even liberal bourgeois elements within the First International um, trying to use the organization to, prom to promote their agenda. Um, in some sections, it was actually bourgeois elements. In, Swiss in Switzerland, there was a, a coulerie. Who was, he was an actual bourgeois who adhered. British trade unionists didn't accept Marx's ideas. They saw it more as promoting their own narrow trade union interests, uh, such as during strikes. Um, in France, the Proudhonists led uh, most of the sections of the First International. Um, but once the organization was formed, it was gradually moving in the direction of communism on the basis of, it, of the experience. And here, something that the sects of today could learn something from Karl Marx. He didn't set up the First International as a pure uh, uh, organization. He was prepared to work with different tendencies within that organization. And he worked it up gradually over a period of time to a communist understanding. Um, and if you look at the history of the development of the First International, um, the first uh, conference, conference, not Congress, was held in London in 1865. Um, but apart from Britain, um, the labor movement was still in its uh, uh, early stages, embryonic stages. That conference decided for a Congress with delegates from organizations who, who could vote in the Congress. What was the base of this First International? Britain, France, Switzerland, Germany, and Austria, to begin with. Um, there were the beginnings of, of, of initial groups in Italy, Spain, and also in the United States in, in, in Chicago, a Congress of Workers expressed interest in this new organization. Um, Marx used it as a forum to combat, to educate and to combat alien ideologies within the labor movement. Um, it was made up of local sections. It was an interesting organization. It wasn't the French section or the Swiss section, but it was the Paris branch, the Bordeaux branch, the Marseille branch, the London branch, etc. Um, it was um, uh, different branches all belonging to one international um, organization. Um, you had tendencies at the time, such as Blanqui, who believed in conspiratorial and insurrectionist methods, not connected to the mass of the working class. Or you had Proudhonism, which were basically pacifist uh, anarchists. Both trends opposed political struggle by the working class as an independent class um, uh, in itself. Um, and it was an expression of certain layers of the working class, upper layers, um, who, who were, saw themselves as rising within society um, and also reflected the lack of industrial development in many of these countries. Um, in, in um, 1866, there was the Congress in Geneva, um, and some within that organization proposed that it become a, a cooperative movement rather than a political expression of the working class. But Marx worked within it, and if you look at each Congress up until the end of the First International, you will see the, co the, the organization moving step by step in the direction of um, uh, Marx's uh, ideas. And here we see something in terms of the method, I'll have to skip because of time here, um, the method of Marx was to build up the organization, to use every experience of the class struggle, to draw lessons and help the workers participating in that movement to move to a higher stage. Um, Engels refers to this many years later, where he said you can't force down the throats of American workers, ready-made ideas, you've got to build it up and you've got to basically travel with the working class and use the experience to take them one step further. And that's what they did. They eventually um, moved in the direction where the, um, uh, the 
the, for instance, the, uh, in, in the Congress, the Second Congress of 1867, um, they, a resolution for the uh, collective ownership of the means of transport, for instance, was passed, moving more and more in the direction of a socialist um, program. The international was involved in solidarity activities. When there were strikes of workers in one country, the workers of another country would, would come out in solidarity. We also see the method. Um, it, you see here, um, he, he, um, he was not, he was not wi um, willing to impose on the mass of workers a system which, is, which was not an obvious deduction from their experience in the daily struggle. In addition, he wished to avoid forcing the pace of proletarian movement. He understood the working class moves at its own pace and it draws lessons from its experience. You can't artificially impose an acceleration on that, which is what some sectarians think. They think that their role is to go to the working class and raise their consciousness just by going and talking to them and telling them they need socialist revolution. Marx understood the workers can reach that conclusion from their experience. The role of the communists obviously is to, is to uh, actively participate and help in that process, always being one step ahead of the class and helping it to move on. Um, and he understood that the natural extension of the economic and industrial struggle would lead to political conclusions and the struggle to achieve their ends within capitalism would lead the workers to understand that capitalism itself is the problem and at a certain point the conclusions would be drawn that the system has to be overthrown and not just in one country but on, on an international uh, scale. Um, now, um, in, uh, when they had the, Congre the conference in Lausanne, a resolution which was passed on the struggle for political freedoms actually led to the arrests of the members in France, which led to the dissolution of the Paris section of the International, and they were forced to go underground. Um, there's lists of other, other, other struggles they were involved in. At the Third Congress in 1868, they dealt with the question of war, and that's where they discussed the question of how do we avoid a war between peoples, i.e. workers killing workers. We have to transform it into a civil war, into a class war. And this is the basis of the thinking, actually, which later on would become the thinking of the Second International um, when, it, when it developed. What were the membership of this organization? Well, um, in, um, in Britain, you had affiliated trade unions, which had a lot of members, obviously. Belgium, they calculated 64,000 members. In Britain, there were 230 branches with 95,000 members. Austria, 13,000. Um, it's, it's not easy to calculate in terms of active members because there were affiliated organizations which brought their membership obviously into it. But you can see it had quite a wide influence within the international labor movement. Um, the Congress of 1869 is what finally put an end to the influence of the bourgeois liberals within the international um, and uh, established it as a, as, as a communist organization with clear principles. But that's when, of course, you have the internal problems with the anarchists and Bakunin, which I haven't got time to go into here because of the details. There are plenty of articles on, the website, on, on our website, Marxist.com, would deal with this. But again, um, there was the Paris Commune, which was a key moment um, in, in Marx's life because he analyzed it, the International intervened in the Paris Commune. There were members of the First International on the committee that ran the Paris Commune, but they were a minority. And within those elements, the Marxists, let's say, were a very small minority. They were the, 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 the other tendencies um, uh, dominated. Um, but uh, again, Marx drew conclusions from the Paris Commune. He didn't just keep repeating the same ideas he developed in 1845. For instance, on the question of the state, he very clearly comes out with the idea that the bourgeois state cannot simply be taken over by the working class. It's, a, it's an instrument of bourgeois rule, and therefore it has to be smashed and replaced with something else, i.e. a worker state. That comes from the experience of the Paris Commune. Um, and you see that throughout his life, he um, intervenes in the movement, but also draws lessons out of that movement for the working class and brings the level of understanding to, 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 to a higher stage. But it's in the aftermath of the Paris Commune, the defeat of the Paris Commune, that you have the anarchist intrigues in the First International. Now, anarchists today go around claiming that they are far more democratic, you see, because they don't believe in structures or organizations. I'd invite comrades to read 
uh, Bakunin's thinking of how to change society. He thought that in a country like France, it was enough to have 100 citizens, 100 well-organized cadres, uh, 100 in Italy, 100 in Germany, who respond to Citizen B. You know who Citizen B was? It was him. Um, now, that's not exactly my view of a, of a widely participated mass organization with democracy and freedom of, of discussion. It was a very tight um, organization, but the way they presented it was um, that, that um, they started attacking Marx, um, saying that... Um, he was uh, dictatorial and all the rest of it. In reality, what it meant was Marx was acting on the deci decisions of the Congresses of the International. Bakunin was uh, trying to split away a group of his own. But the, the Paris Commune was the first attempt at a, work, a worker state in history. But it was isolated. Um, there was no coordination. There was no working class party um, leading it. And Marx criticized them for a few fundamental mistakes. They should have attacked Versailles directly and smashed the, 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 the armed forces of the uh, French state. And there was no taking over of the National Bank, which they could have done. There was a lot of extreme naivety within the Commune itself. Marx, the preface to the Communist Manifesto of 1872, read it, and you see the conclusions he draws uh, from that terrible uh, defeat. Um, the defeat of the Paris Commune, again, prepared new conditions for a further expansion of capitalism across Europe. Um, and with it came another period of class collaboration, the British trade unions in particular. But in Britain, a side effect of the Paris Commune, i.e. The, the British bourgeois fearing it, passed the 1871 Act which legalised the trade unions, i.e. they understood that the working class now had become so strong that you couldn't simply crush it, you had to allow, allow it to organise itself and represent itself and then use those nice liberal trade union leaders to try and control um, the class. And this was a period, uh, therefore, of opportunism, of, of mediation, of compromise, and reformist ideas were strong within um, the movement. A, an, an adaptation, let's say, of the, of the working class leaders to bourgeois uh, society. Um, uh, anarchism, not by chance... Italy and Spain, but that's the nature of that society. I've got uh, that in that period. I've got to fast forward, unfortunately. Um, Marx was faced with a situation now of ultra-left anarchists on one side and reformist elements on the other. And you see how history tends to repeat itself. Um, we have a similar situation today. We have the reformists who dominate the labour movement, and then you have the ultra-left uh, um, groups, and none of them can actually reach a proper balanced scientific approach, which is what Marxism is. Um, now, in these conditions, Marx developed what he says in a letter he writes to Engels. He says, how do you deal with these liberals, these trade unionists, these reformists, etc.? Now, we have groups who think, and you see them today, you, you, you'll find them um, in, in, on the fringes of the movement, who think that to be a revolutionary Marxist, you've got to go and insult labor leaders, you got to go and insult trade unionists and uh, denounce them for their reformism and declare revolution. Marx said his method was mild in manner, bold in content, i.e. friendly approach, but you don't give up on the fundamentals and on, on the content. And it's a far more convincing method. Now it's a little detail in one of the letters that he writes, but we stand on that method when you intervene in the labor movement. This is the way Marxists should, should approach other tendencies in how we criticize reformists and other tendencies in the movement. Um, now, um, what did they accuse Marx of, the anarchists? Authoritarianism. Well, as I said, all he was doing was applying the resolutions of the Congresses. Um, in 1872, the, co the, 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 the conflict climaxed at the Hague Congress, and there was the final split between the Marxists and the anarchists. Um, and then eventually, uh, because of the stifling atmosphere in Europe, in London, all the, the emigres from the defeated Paris Commune, there was a, there was a, 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 a demoralized mood in, in, that, in that milieu. Marx initially thought, let's move the center of the international away from this stifling environment, and they shifted the center to New York in the hope of connecting with the rising fresh American working class uh, away from this stifling atmosphere. But eventually, in 1876, 
in Philadelphia, the first international was um, disbanded. Now this was one of the major works of Marx from the early 1860s to the mid 1870s. He dedicated a lot of attention to the building of the first international. The dissolution came with a certain hindsight because he could see the way the, 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 the organized uh, uh, movement was, was moving. The danger of it falling actually into a sectarian stance. Um, I wish the leaders of the, of the Fourth International had had the same hindsight. Instead of allowing the, the Fourth International to become synonymous to absolute crazy sectarianism, they had dissolved it and kept at least the clean banner that Trotsky had established uh, for future generations. The First International didn't suffer that because it was dissolved. But the ideas and the methods continued to live, and, and Marx continued to build on the ideas and to analyze. Um, the first international really was the struggle of Marx to spread the ideas of scientific socialism um, internationally, um, and it laid the basis for what was to become the second international. Um, and it was born, formally speaking, at least on the basis of the ideas of Marxism, whereas the first international had different tendencies and was eventually won to communism by Marx. The second uh, started off like that. Um, Mar Marx's method was to work up the international towards scientific socialism step by step, and eventually that's what he did. Now, between 1872 and 1889, of course, Marx died in 1883, but they maintained correspondence with socialists around Europe. The fact that the organization was formally dissolved didn't end the connections between Marx and um, socialists, communists, Marxists on the continent. The main task of Marx in this period was to develop and clarify the ideas. Now, if somebody thinks that that is separate from his revolutionary activity, that's wrong. Capital took years to write, but what Marx was doing was providing the worker activists with a scientific understanding of the society they were fighting. It wasn't just enough to be instinctively against class, class um, exploitation, class injustice, etc. It was necessary to understand the system that you were in and understand when that system and how that system goes into crisis and what that produces in terms of the movement of the working class and class consciousness. Marx dedicated years the fact that he couldn't finish capital is because he was involved in so many different activities. Running the first international, for example, writing the resolutions. Or, I've read, I've read a book which is based on all the eyewitnesses of Marx and Engels. Um, some of them very hostile, some of them very friendly, depends on who it was. But you read scenarios like, down the pub in East London somewhere, or in central London where he lived, meeting with Russians, Germans, Italians for a drink, and discussing the ideas and discussing the work in their country. And I thought, oh, how, many how many times have we done that down the pub? Same thing, talking about building the organization. Um, this was his, um, his, his, uh, his, his regular activity. Engels, when he moved to London, uh, had a bit more money. He had a house well stocked with good wine. Sundays were dedicated, it was an open day. You could turn up at Engels' house if you were a comrade. It was great. I wish we had a comrade like that. And he turned up and he would, he would get one of his excellent bottles of wine and he would spend the day talking with Bernstein or Kautsky or whoever it was at the time um, and um, discussing what was happening in these countries and how to build the organization. This is what they were involved in. And this took up, 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 uh, took, took, took up a lot of time. Um, so capital, in fact, was finished by Engels on the basis of taking the, 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 the manuscripts that Marx had, uh, had left. But Marx did see the beginnings of a new international organization. For instance, the founding of the German Social Demo uh, Social uh, Socialist Workers' Party of Germany in 1875. Um, that's where he wrote, uh, in Go at Gotha, that's where the uh, critique of the Gotha program comes, because he was, he was very critical of the way it was organized, because of the, com the compromise with the ideas of La Salle. There was a, always a, a struggle for the ideas on the part of Marx. Um, when that par party was founded, Marx was fuming when he, read the, when he read the program. He said his comrades, the Marxists, had compromised with the La Salians. He was prepared at one point to come out openly against them and denounce them, but then he drew the conclusion, which is interesting if you think of 
our tendency in the way we approach organizations of the working class, he felt, although it was um, defective and had some wrong ideas, the emergence of a, a mass workers' party in Germany would be seen very positively by the working class, and in spite of its shortcomings, the Marxist could work within that milieu, basing himself on his previous experience with the First International and working it up towards being um, um, a Marxist uh, party. Um, and I'll have to move on. Engels complains about the theoretical uh, decline of the party because of that. Um, but uh, that's why he wrote Anti Doring, for example, to combat those alien ideas. Um, and um, uh, also the dialectics of nature. Theory for Marx and Engels were not abstract concepts in and of themselves. They were tools for strengthening the organization of the working class. And therefore, those books like Anti Doring, like the dialectics of nature, were to arm the cadres of the Marxist movement um, as they built up an organization. Um, uh, in France, there was a movement towards uh, an organization. First, in 1879, a Socialist Workers' Congress was organized. Engels actually adapted from Andy Doring and wrote the shorter text of Socialism, Utopian and Scientific in 1880 to help Lafargue in France in building um, the, new, uh, the new party. So you see, um, uh, in 1880, Marx and Engels helped to draft the party program in France. In 1881, the Parti Ouvrier was formed. Um, uh, uh, the f uh, first real, let's say, Marxist workers' organization in France. So, um, you see, Marx did see the beginnings of a new international organization which he'd worked for in the first. And we see the, the creation of sections of new organizations, and I'll, I'll give the list, in Denmark in 1878, in Belgium 1885, Marx was dead by then, of course, um, it went on to develop into what was to become the socialist international. And Marx saw the beginnings of that. In 1880, the German Social Democratic Party <coughs> supported the call of its Belgian comrades to call an International Socialist Congress in 1881. So you have the beginnings of that movement towards the Second International, which Marx was able to see uh, before he died. This is the work of um, Karl Marx, um, theory and action. He and Engels actively participated in the 1848 revolution. Engels was involved in the fighting. They were put on trial because of that. They had to flee to exile. They were expelled from one country after another, eventually settling in Britain. Now, there is a monument in London to Karl Marx. I personally don't like it very much. Um, I prefer the original little tombstone that was there, because that's how Marx was actually buried. But it's not important. That's a question of taste. Some of you might like it. Um, the real monument to Karl Marx is not in Highgate Cemetery. The real monument are his collected works, his theory, his ideas, and the people who today actively intervene and work to build the Marxist movement, to complete the task that Marx gave himself right from the early days of the Communist League, which is the overthrow of the bourgeoisie and the bringing to power of the working class and an end to class society, which remains our program, which many have broken with over the years, of course, uh, all the, the various reformist trends. But you see, Marx intervened. He then drew lessons from the experience that he was involved in, like in 1848, like the Paris Commune and so on. He analyzed the system as a whole. He analyzed events and he built an organization to intervene. He didn't limit himself just to writing books. He built not just a, one organization, he built an international organization across many countries because he understood that the socialism is, a, is an international system. But always with attention to theory. He understood that an organization without theory is nothing. But at the same time, theory without an organization is nothing. One goes with the other. But I tell you, of the two, if you don't have a clear theory, you will not build an efficient organization, an effective organization to intervene into the working class. So 200 years later, after, after his birth, of course, um, Marx stands as our model. We defend his fundamental ideas. We defend what aims he gave himself and the movement, which is the overthrow of capitalism and the establishment 
of a world socialist order. That is, the, that is the fundamental idea that he expressed, and we defend it 200 years later, um, in spite of all the attempts to claim that his ideas are not valid. The number of times, I'll end on this, I've read in The Economist, oh, on this question, Marx was right, as if it was the only one, except I've read it more than once, <laughs> and each time it was something different. So the honesty would be that he must have been right at least two or three times. Um, but they, they, uh, and the general line is, well, he had an interesting analysis of capitalism, but it was conclusions were wrong, you see, because he said it would lead inevitably to socialism, which shows a complete lack of understanding of Marx's uh, ap approach to this question. Marx's ideas remain the best explanation of history, the scientific explanation of history, his method um, allows us to understand the world we live in today and how capitalism works. Nobody, as far as I'm concerned, or Marxists are concerned, have come up with a better explanation of how this system works, why it enters into crisis. You know, the, the bourgeois economists are always declaring the death of Marx or death of Marxism. You see, I, I've known people that have died and they die once. And I don't have to keep repeating that they're dead. It's abundantly clear that they're dead. My, my father died 40 years ago. I don't have to say, he's dead again. He died once and that's it. Why do they keep declaring the death of Marxism? Well, because it's alive. And they would like to see it dead. But it won't die. And the reason it won't die is because it corresponds to the real events that are taking place today. It corresponds to the way capitalism works today. And that's what gives it life. Because it's the, it's the truth. Now, somebody will say, oh, you're being very rigid, very dogmatic. I invite anybody to explain a better way of understanding the society we live in. I haven't found one yet because Marx explains the real processes. And we have to base ourselves on that and build a tendency to change society. Marx, he said, philosophers so far have interpreted the world, which is very nice. I like history too. I like it from just from pure interest in history. I like all kinds of stuff, cultural stuff. But <laughs> it's not enough just to like history or to study it or to read it for pleasure, which is a nice thing to do. I love it. But as a Marxist, it has a purpose, i.e. you study it to apply it to change society. And that's what Marx said. The task is to change it. And that's what we're here for.